May it please the court. My name is Joanna Faust, and I represent Virginia Poindexter. Your Honors, we're here today um, pursuant to the grant of summary judgment by the lower court. Your Honor, it's our argument that the district court erred in finding that Ms. Poindexter failed to send a qualified written request, such as to sufficiently state a claim under the Real Estate um, Settlement Procedures Act, that the district court further erred in finding that Ms. Poindexter's Virginia Consumer Protection Act claim, slander of title, breach of contract, and claim under Virginia Code 55.66.3 were time barred, that uh, Mercedes-Benz does not qualify as, quote, a mortgage lender, um, such that Ms. Poindexter cannot state a Virginia Consumer Protection Act claim. And finally, with respect to her slander of title and breach of contract claims, there was more than sufficient evidence in the record such for a reasonable jury to find that she had stated a case for cause of action, or cause of action. If they're, a, if they're not a, a mortgage lender, then you wouldn't have a claim under RESPA. Your Honor, the, mor- the RESPA goes to the, the holder, the holder of the loan that makes or holds the loan. Um, the, but the, you have to send a qualified written request to, the, to a servicer of a more federally related mortgage loan. Yes, yes, Your Honor. Um, we, we do not dispute that uh, Mercedes-Benz was the servicer. The serv- they, were, they are the servicer. They were the servicer of the loan. But they weren't the lender. They weren't the lender itself because under the Virginia um, Code 6.6, under, pardon me, Your Honor, under Virginia Code 6.2-1600, a mortgage lender is uh, defined as an entity that originates or makes a mortgage loan, not a um, loan, um, not a servicer. Um, Mercedes-Benz, I think it's undisputed, was not, they neither originated nor made the loan itself. When the loan was originally made, it was an installment loan for a car, and it was made by non And they converted it to one secured by real estate. I- I'm sorry, Your Honor, I didn't they hear you. Con- wasn't it converted to one secured by real estate? Your Honor, it was assigned by HBL to Mercedes-Benz. They assigned it, and pursuant to that, a deed of trust was issued. But there was no... But that wouldn't be part of the assignment. Lender and which at that point would be Mercedes Benz, the lender and the debtor would have to agree to that. And, and Ms. Mer- um, Ms. Poindexter did agree to issue a deed of trust or to to have a deed of trust put on her property itself. Um, but Your Honor, when the uh, deed of trust was was issued, Mercedes Benz specifically wrote um, that no further payments needed to be made on the loan, or that the pay- she was already making payments on the loan and that no further payments needed to, um, to be made to, to get the deed of trust. Uh, Mercedes-Benz got something very valuable to them. They were able to make sure if a, um, if a uh, purchaser of this luxury car ever were to default, they would have a lien on that person's house. But there wasn't any additional monetary consideration. The loan itself was assigned, and she executed the deed of trust. They became the servicer of the loan. I think that that's, that's clear in the record and uh, undisputed. But uh, under the... Well, this seems kind of odd that you'd have the servicer of a loan who's now the holder of a mortgage. Yes, sir. Um, but for the Virginia Consumer Protection Act uh, defines a mortgage lender under 6.2-1600 as an entity that originates or makes the mortgage loan. The, the loan that was made was an installment loan by HBL. They didn't originate it, Mercedes-Benz, neither originate it nor they made it. They were assigned it, and they took over the servicing of it, but they aren't a defined mortgage lender under the Virginia statute. So who's the service of the loan? Mercedes-Benz, Your Honor. And not TD Auto Finance? Um, you, uh, they are the successor in interest of TDAF. Your Honor, this because it happened uh, several years ago. Um, the TDAF is is the um, is Mercedes Benz Credit Corp, and Mercedes Benz Financial Service is uh, defending or was defending the case um, pursuant to an agreement through um, with TDAF. TDAF is who filed the certificate of satisfaction, the successor in interest to Mercedes Benz Credit Corp. So why? Um... You've got all these different uh, uh, theories yes, sir. Um, that you're trying. Um, you know, you've got a slander of title claim and the Virginia Consumer Protection Act and the Real Estate Settlement Protection Act. Yes, sir. I mean, you've got all of these things you sort of 
firing with in the hope that one of them might gain some traction. But tucked there at the very end is the breach of contract claim. And was there a... I'm surprised you didn't make more of it. Why wasn't... Why wasn't... What's the problem with a straightforward breach of contract claim? There is no problem with it, Your Honor, and we believe that that is a claim that should have survived. Because these different statutes, I have questions about whether they really fit or apply to your situation. And I understand that, Your Honor. Part of the reason is that the different statutes provide a remedy for different types of damages, including that of attorney's fees. It should be noted that it took filing a federal suit for Mercedes-Benz International Corporation to file a certificate of satisfaction. Because of that, Ms. Poindexter lost the loan that she wanted to have to refinance. Now, she did eventually, seven months later, well into this suit, find a new loan that was comparable. But because of that, she lost monthly mortgage payments. I don't know whether she lost the chance to refinance because of the failure to remove the lien or whether she didn't. But that would be a question of damages, wouldn't it? It wouldn't be a question of liability. No, no, Your Honor. I'm sorry. I didn't mean to give that impression. That is a question of damages. But the damages that she suffered weren't just the new loan that she eventually got, which was not the loan that she was originally, and that was a disputed fact. She was denied that loan because of the cloud that was on her title. But because of that, she... Well, your point is they were under a duty to remove the lien once the debt was either satisfied or... Yes, Your Honor. Once the debt... Once she never missed a payment and once she made her last... And your view is that the failure to remove the lien once the debt was no longer in existence was a breach. Yes, sir. It was a breach, yes. She issued... She allowed a deed of trust to be put on her property in the hope that... Or in the return for which she made... Now, what about the statute of limitations argument with respect to the contract claim? Now, Your Honor, I would argue that with respect to that, that every day that Mercedes-Benz Credit Corporation continued to fail to release the deed of trust from the property, and it wasn't released until November of 2013, not only was that being published... But we wouldn't need a continuing breach theory here, would we? Because I think it was in May of 2013, you actually notified them. I notified... Ms. Poindexter notified her husband, the title company, and her counsel all notified them, yes. All right. And was MVCC notified that they had to remove the lien? Yes, Your Honor, they were. You're saying that's not disputed? I don't believe that is disputed, Your Honor. They were... It's included in the record, the title company's fax to them that included the deed of trust that was still active, as well as the certified letters. So what you're saying is that the failure to act after the May 2013 notification, and the fact that they only acted after the federal suit was filed... Yes, Your Honor, after it was filed. That the failure to respond in a timely notice that they had obligations under the servicing contract... Under the... They were the loan servicer, yes, Your Honor. Yeah. Or their successor in interest was the loan servicer. Right. To remove the lien, you think that's an additional breach? I do, Your Honor. Yes, we do, Your Honor. How is that different from the breach as of the time that the debt was paid? Your Honor... There's only one contract here. There is only one real estate settlement, a retail installment contract. That was for the purchase of the automobile. Several months later, after it had been signed, was when the deed of trust was put on the property. So when your client paid it off, why wouldn't the statute of limitations start to run from that day? Because, Your Honor, they continued to fail to release it up until and through 2013. 
Um, we How made is that different from any other breach of a contract? Um, Your Honor, I would argue because it, it, they had a continuing duty as the servicer, whether the loan was paid off or not, um, under the real estate settlement, under RESPA, as well as under this breach of contract, they remained the loan servicer. There was no other way to get anyone to remove. Only the holder can remove the deed of trust. Yeah, but the question on the breach of contract is when it starts to run, and you're looking at it from the standpoint of when a party to the contract would have known, there's no allegation here of hiding the ball or some sort of a fraudulent activity. This is a public record. Not fraudulent, Your Honor, uh, but there was a second car that was purchased in 2004 when this car was was paid off. Um, when that car was paid off, it was said that the security interest has been released. Now, I understand Mercedes's point was, well, that was for car two, not for car one. But this is an individual. This is the first and only time she ever did this. Um, we made an argument um, pursuant to the equitably, equitable estoppel. I don't, I'm not arguing that it was fraud or that there was any lie there. But when an individual is told, we have no further interest in your vehicle, um, we have no, well, not in the vehicle, but an interest in her home, an interest that created a continuing cloud on her title that prevented the refinance of the property in 2000, all the way up until 2013. When, she, when is when she realized but what I mean what during that period of 10 years or so what was the barrier for your client to determine that there was a breach it, there was no barrier your honor this is a public record in the circuit court of Loudoun County but it, it, respectfully it, it's not her duty this isn't like a closing a real estate closing where everyone sits in a room and signs papers this was a one-off for her, but supposedly something that had been done many, many times for Mercedes-Benz, although they did testify they had no policies and procedures to release these liens. She, I think her diligence has shown the moment she was informed by her title company in 2013, she and her husband sprang into action. Um, why would there be, I think the question for the jury was well, whether... Your best case under Virginia law that the statute of limitations would not have started to run as of the time she paid off the loan. Your Honor, that that the equitable estoppel would have stopped, uh, would have would have stalled um, Mercedes Benz. Well, what's your What's your best case under Virginia law? Because Virginia law determines that statute of limitations are to be strictly enforced. So yes, Your Honor. Tell me what your best case is. Uh, best. Best case scenario or best case that I'm relying best on? Best case from the Supreme Court of Virginia that would support your position. Um, your Honor, the the best case would be that um, again that uh, the Latay versus Commercial Industrial um, Construction case, the 1982 Virginia Supreme Court case, again to show to establish equitable estoppel, absent a showing of fraud or deception, a representation, reliance, a change of position, and a detriment. Your Honor, um, to the extent that the statute of state limitations would have applied, um, it was a question for the jury to show whether she reasonably relied on the, the fact that, um, reasonably relied on the fact that um, she, it was her duty to go down and check the land records. Um, is that an argument you made below on equitable estoppel? Yes, it is, Your Honor. All right, thank you. Thank you, Your Honor. I'm for the rebuttal time. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Mr. Mastro. Good morning, Your Honors. May it please the Court, Frank Mastro on behalf of the Appellee Mercedes-Benz uh, Credit Corporation. Your Honor, let me address first uh, a point which was made uh, by my opponent regarding uh, the breach in the, uh, the 2008 letter. That was, we have to keep in mind two things. One is that that letter coming in 2008 that's four years after the loan was paid off. So to the extent uh, Ms. Poindexter is claiming any reliance, I mean, that's got to occur within the limitations period. Otherwise, you couldn't, can't reasonably rely on something that occurs after limitations to bring it back into limitations. And then, as counsel pointed out, it does concern a different vehicle. A 2008 the letter concerns a 2003, I think it is, Mercedes. The subject vehicle is a 2000 Audi, different VIN numbers, different account numbers. 
and it just de dealt with the release of a motor vehicle lien on that vehicle. So th there's no way there can be any reasonable reliance uh, by Did Ms. Poindexter. Did you tell them at any point that, that Poindexter, at any point that you'd released the lien? No, no. We never told Poindexter that the lien had been released. I think this is a case where both sides honestly forgot. I mean, in, it, the record reflects that in 2001, about six months after the original transaction, that Mercedes-Benz Credit Corporation got folded into uh, a Daimler-Chrysler I mean, entity. You, know, you, you say you forgot, but the one thing people rely on financial institutions to do is to keep the record straight. Well, that's... And I think, wasn't it reasonable for her to assume that you'd release the lien once it no longer applied? Was it reasonable for her to assume? But she's yeah. got to do some due diligence. I mean, just to assume so that the lien had been released. That, you know, she's a lay person. You suggest that she has to go down to the... drive down to the Loudoun County Court um, and check the... Uh, the uh, public records in, in that courthouse or alternatively hire an attorney uh, to get this lien released. I mean, there's something that bothers me here and that, you know, you should have released, you should have released the lien and you didn't even release the lien when in May 2013 they were, you were uh, informed that um, the... Uh, Lien was discovered in the course of the Poindexter's um, attempt to refinance the home, and you still didn't release it. For, you know, from May 2013 to September 2013, the lien remained on the books after I understand you'd been informed of it. I mean, people rely on financial institutions. That's your job. That's your business to keep people's record straight and not to saddle them with liens after there's no reason for the lien because the, the, the vehicle has been sold or they've got another car. The whole subject of the lien was not in the Poindexter's possession. Your Honor, in June of 2013, after Mercedes-Benz Financial Services had been contacted by the Poindexter's, they contacted TD Auto Finance, and TD Auto Finance sent a lien release to Ms. Poindexter's title company. For some reason, her title company never filed that. Then the lawsuit got filed, and then once the lawsuit got filed, Mercedes-Benz Financial again contacted TD Auto Finance, and then the lien was immediately filed. I mean, the lien release was immediately filed. So um, I, I want to correct that uh, for the record, I don't know if that came up in the summary judgment pleading because I don't know that it was relevant to the decision below, but it's certainly in the deposition transcripts that are uh, attached uh, in but the record the extract. Dexters, wouldn't you be pretty angry about what happened here? That a lien was kept on the books? And who knows how damaging it can be to someone's credit? Not just an, uh, an effort to refinance, but an effort to draw loans on one thing or another. The lien just hanging around. Um, for years after it's supposed to be removed. If you were the Poindexters, wouldn't you be pretty upset? Well, I, I might be a little, but I think the Poindexters, all Miss Poindexter testified between 2004 and 2012, she never made any effort to contact uh, Mercedes-Benz, TD Auto Finance, any of these companies to determine whether or not the lien had been released. Even when the 2008 letter came in, it didn't trigger something that said, hey, maybe I ought to check and see if that other lien uh, has been released. You know, did I get a letter like that? Let me check. I mean, nothing caused her to take any action until 2013. And then by that time, you know, unfortunately, the statute of limitations, uh, certainly for the breach of contract, had expired because the, the statute of limitations accrues upon the breach, not when the damage has been discovered. And that's, you know, black letter Virginia law. So in, in these circumstances, you know, it's unfortunate but, uh, you know, it's nine years too late. Or if, if it's a two-year limitation, it becomes seven years uh, too late. So, you know, the statute of limitations has to be strictly uh, enforced uh, in this case. And so the uh, question goes to the whole, even with the statute of limitations having run after five years, is what 
can you do after does that, that doesn't mean you can't do anything after five years. It's still on the property. As Wilkerson's question goes to once you know it's still there and you do nothing, uh, even after the statute of limitation, is that a different type of action? Maybe not under the contract, but maybe. Well, if, if there was some showing that Mercedes-Benz <coughs> affirmatively refused to remove the lien and said, yes, the lien is still there, we're going to enforce this lien. We believe we still have a lien. There's been no evidence in the record that there was any affirmative act by Mercedes-Benz Credit Corp. to say, hey, we're still enforcing this lien. No, it's quite the opposite. As soon as they were contacted, they contacted TD Auto Finance because they were the entity that has to file the lien release as the legal successor and arranged for TD Auto Finance to first forward the lien release to the title company in June of 2013 and then ultimately, I believe it, was October or November of 2013 when the lien release actually got filed after in Loudoun County after the lawsuit was initiated. So never at any point, once they were contacted, did the defendants in this case say, hey, yeah, we still believe that lien exists. And I think that would be a different circumstance because then you're affirming the existence of a lien. But if you're a consumer and you've repaid a loan, wouldn't you expect that the lender would remove or release any lien if you've repaid a loan? Do you have to say, you have to call them and say, hey, have you released a lien? I mean, wouldn't, a, wouldn't an ordinary consumer think, look, I've paid the loan, the debt has been fully satisfied? Well, I think it's like any other contractual situation where you, if another party has a duty under a contract and that party uh, doesn't... The duty was, would be on you to release the lien, wouldn't it? Correct. The duty is, is absolutely on, on the secured party to release, release the lien. And under even under Virginia Code 5566.3, there's a 90-day uh, time limit that's uh, overlaid I mean, You on may this. squeeze out of this on a matter of law because of the statute of limitations, but it's shabby what happened here. It's shabby. I, I agree, Your Honor. I can't deny that it's an unfortunate set of circumstances. Uh, you know, but that's, um, you know, those are the facts that we're dealing with in this case, Your Honor. People don't have uh, times. That she, she shouldn't have to check the land records, to, to check the public records, and take time out of her life to go on a record search or spend money to hire an attorney to check public records to see if you've done what you should have done. I understand, Your Honor, and I... Like I said, if had Mercedes-Benz gotten a, a, a communication from her in the intervening eight years, I think we'd have a different case. Um, but, uh, you know, those aren't the facts that we're, uh, you know, dealing with in this case. And I still don't understand when it was brought to your attention. You say, oh, this was a long period of time when she did nothing. Well, she had no reason to do anything during that period of time. But when she did have a reason to do something which was in May 2013, and she was informed about the continued existence of the, um, of the, uh, of the lien. She notified you in May 2013, and the lien still wasn't released, and it was only by the threat of litigation, which again she shouldn't have had to undertake. Well, I think Before the... a very simple act on your part, was undertaken. It wasn't right. You don't treat people this way. Understood, Your Honor. I would just point out that when we were contacted in May of 2013, it was early June. It was mid-May and late May and early June is when the letter went, the lien release went to the uh, title company uh, of Ms. Poindexter. So I believe the record ref would reflect that we acted uh, diligently and, and turned this around very quickly. You know, within less than a month that they had a lien release letter to the um, title company. And I think the record also reflects, although the, I don't know if this comes out in summary judgment, but that Ms. Poindexter uh, did a, I don't know if it was a refinance, I think she took out a home equity line of credit in around 2005 and 2006, that time period. And the whole lien issue apparently wasn't discovered then. So, I mean, there was opportunity uh, for her to discover it then, but it wasn't. 
So, um, you know, I, I think uh, while it's certainly, um, you know, things could have been different on my client's end, I think things could have also been different on you know, Ms. Poindexter's end. You know, companies look at people's financial records. If you want a loan, she might have said on the loan application that, you know, they, there's always a section on the loan about present indebtedness and, and are there any liens against your property and everything. If she would be applying for a loan, she would have answered that question, no. And then you would have thought, oh, this person's trying to defraud us. Um, and the person is dissembling. All kinds of complications arise in people's lives when they, because they're, people are judged on the basis of their credit records in all kinds of different ways. When they apply for jobs, when they apply for loans, in all kinds of different ways, people want to know whether you meet your responsibilities and whether you're a creditworthy risk. And, this, and, she, and she's got this burden that she never should have had. I mean, I, I, I think, you know, we've, you know, we've addressed that, uh, Your Honor. I totally understand, uh, you know, the point you're trying to make. Had Ms. Poindexter, you know, discovered that and requested, uh, you know, a letter or you contact someone else to say, hey, this lien isn't there, I'm sure my client would have done that. I mean, there's no evidence in the record that, Mercedes-Benz ever, after learning that this lien was still on the books, I'm not attempted saying to that enforce there's it. malice or anything. I think the you know the slander of title claim is just totally a non-starter, and I'm and I'm very dubious about the question of whether the Real Estate Settlement Act has any applicability here. Or the Virginia Consumer Protection Act. I don't, I don't, I don't see it. There are too many things that were thrown against the wall. I'm talking about a simple breach of, of contract theory, which I understand Virginia law is strict on the statute of limitations point, but you know, this isn't a case that makes anybody feel very good. No, Your Honor. No. I mean, I think we all wish the uh, facts in this case could have been a little different. Uh, unless your honors have anything else, um, I'll cede the rest of my time. Thank you. Thank you. Your Honor, if I may, I understand your point about the slander of title, but I think that the discussion just showed um, what a definition of val a malice that the Virginia Supreme Court has approved in these cases. Malice doesn't have to be a sinister or corrupt motive. It can be a gross indifference or recklessness. Well, on the basis of this record, the most I see is negligence. I don't, I don't, see, the, I don't see the kind of malice here. That, that, that goes too far. And, I, you know, slander of title, I haven't seen very many of those succeed. And, you know, that seems... To try to make this into a punitive damage case or a malice case goes way beyond what I'm prepared to understood, what I would Your Honor. Be prepared to accept. But with respect to the the question of indifference, um, the title company it wasn't Mrs. Poindexter's title company. It was the title company of the new lender, Chase Financial. So right here, it's in the record, and as counsel said, Mercedes once informed didn't send it to the land records, the land records. They sent it to a third party that had no duty, that did nothing with it. So that's why... It was your client's lender. It, potential lender. They were applying for the lender, and there had been a title search. It wasn't, it wasn't their lender. It was Chase Finance. They wanted it to be their lender. And that lender, Chase Financial, had a title company do a title search, and that title company said... There's a lien. And so when Mercedes was informed, they just sent a certificate of satisfaction to the title company, a title company that had no part, that had no affiliation with the Poindexters other than the fact that they hoped one day that would be their lender. Wouldn't How is that, that? Wouldn't that be sort of normal that if there's going to be a, a closing on that, that the secured creditor sends the certificate of satisfaction, and when there's a closing, at one time. 
But, Your Honor, the duty that they had, both under the Virginia Code as well as the contract, wasn't to send it to, they could have been denied for a different reason. Perhaps Ms. Poindexter would have lost her job and Chase would have said, you're not someone that we want to take a chance. There's no doubt they could have sent the certificate of satisfaction directly to the court. To the courthouse with the recording fee for that. With the recording fee. You can't make the argument that they didn't do something. No, no, I'm sorry, Your Honor, I wasn't trying to say that. My point was to show that an international corporation here who got this benefit for so many years, the indifference with the consumer's land, I mean, land is important. Yes, they did something, but it fell so far below what they were supposed to do, and because of this, she suffered damages. And I understand Your Honor's point about overreaching and trying to get something, to get too much, but under every cause of action she could possibly have, please remove the certificate, please file a certificate under Virginia 5530. Slander of title, a continuing slander on her title for every breach of contract. From the first instance, as I understand, initially this was an installment loan? It was a car loan, yes, sir. And then it was your client that sought to get the deed of trust for tax purposes? No, Your Honor, it was a program that Mercedes was offering, so they sent her a letter asking her if she wanted to participate. She didn't, yes, they asked and she said yes. And she did it for tax purposes? For tax purposes, yes, sir. An unusual kind of arrangement. It is very unusual, it's my understanding, well, through discovery, that it's no longer something that Mercedes offers. I'm not sure you could do it under the current mortgage laws. I think you're probably right. In typical real estate type situations, as odd as this seems, it does happen that someone, even in a real estate transaction, a lien can be left on a house without having been counseled by the trustee or someone there. So, I mean, that part about it is the reason for the 90-day rule in Virginia. So you can come back and say, well, you'll get $500 if they don't do it in such and such a date. Yes, sir. Which sort of incentivizes the person with the lien on it to go say, well, I can get $500 now that you haven't counseled on my house. Yes, sir. But you didn't do that, of course, within that 90-day period. And then you're sort of there with this encumbrance on your house. And Judge Wilkinson is correct. Nobody wants to have an encumbrance on your house. But the law is kind of funny on that kind of thing, particularly in real estate. That thing is on your house. And even though you don't have a duty to go and check it out, if someone has something on your house, you ought to want to know it's not up there anymore before, you know, a series of nine years pass. I mean, you would think. Understood, Your Honor. But the moment that it was. There still is a consumer beware type law that goes on. And I'm not so sure it tracks in. That's the reason for the statute of limitations. You have five years. That's where you get the whole time period in there under this contract to deal. But if you do nothing for nine years. What should she have done, Your Honor? Go to the land records? I mean, would people. Is it the duty of consumers? It's on her house. She's living there. She should probably check to see if there's anything on her house. Yes, sir. But I made a mortgage loan. I didn't then run to Fairfax County to make sure it wasn't still on my home, that my refinance or my equity. I mean, that's on the lender. That's on the. And that's why the statute says when you. I've got a title insurer up there that's going to make sure that someone takes it off. You don't have it in this type of situation. That's true, Your Honor. That's a good point. There wasn't anything. It's the unusual nature of what's going on. It's very unusual. And ultimately what happens is when you get to the end of the day on this whole thing that's going on, it's off the house. It is now. She has a loan. She's paying about $8 more a month. We keep saying the $8, Your Honor. She paid for 13 months. She paid the higher rate. She paid title closing. She paid inspection. The $8, I think it's very a sexy figure. Oh, it's only $8. Why are you here in federal court? Why did you come to the Court of Appeals? It's more than $8. But summary judgment was on liability and not on damages. But she suffered much more and has than $8 damage-wise. I'm sorry, Your Honor. I didn't mean to interrupt. No, that's okay. All of which she doesn't get if the statute of limitations is run. True, Your Honor. It goes back to the initial point that Judge Agee is making here under Virginia law. I do. That's pretty hard stuff against you. I mean, equities aside in terms of how bad it is, you've got to say 
this injury occurred when they didn't do what they were supposed to do. Yes, sir. And that's why, um, it, it, as, a, as, as her counsel, I also looked at the Real Estate Settlement Procedures Act, which states that once a written request has been made, that then is, there's, there's, I think, no dispute that she was within the statute of limitations for that. There were four qualified written requests made, and the j- judge below found that there were zero. Um, that, Your Honor, is her remedy in the case if the Virginia law is too harsh on the breach of contract. Um, I see my time has expired, sir. Thank you. Thank you. We'll come down and greet counsel. Thank you, sir. Moving.